All right, I would like to call the October 21st, 2020 virtual meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 regular board meeting to order. Uh, Mary, may I, I have a roll call? Yes. Shalwood. Here. Peyton Howell. Here. Figaro. Here. Rago. Here. Ramirez. Ramirez. Tinko Pong. Here. Wiedemann. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Please, please join me in reciting uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic of the United States one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm getting a lot of feedback on my end here. Is every is anybody else getting a lot of feedback? I'm not. I'm, I'm good. I'm not. I'm oh, not. now I'm. I'm not now. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, James, could you please uh, read our Fenton mission beliefs and Bison Way statements? Sure. Mission statement, cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationship. Belief statements, successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engaged learning. School and home collaborative effectively. We provide a safe, secure, and caring environment. We infuse social and emotional learning into academics and culture. Diversity empowers our learning community, and we prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibilities. The Bison Way, students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, and pathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together, and hold each other to higher expectations to become the leaders and innovators of the future. All right. Thank you, thank you James. Uh, Mary, do we have any uh, requests for public comments? Yes, we do. Uh, I just want to take a moment to remind everyone uh, that the public comments will be limited to three minutes. And please do not mention staff members or students by name. The proper protocol for lodging concerns would be teacher, principal, superintendent, administrator, et cetera. All concerns brought directly to the board will be relegated back to the proper party responsible. And no action will be taken in response to a petition at a board meeting. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, James, uh, will you will read the um, public comment. I sure will. Uh, we have seven uh, public comments here. The first one is from Mr. Patrick Escobedo, FEA president. President Wiedemann and members of the board, the FEA and I would like to thank you for the inclusion at the last month's board meeting to share our equity resolution. As we stated then, equity is something that we are strongly committed to, in addition to our resolution from the presentation by our administrators at that meeting. I am sure you can see that it is something that permeates the school culture of Fenton. A more equitable school for all of our students is an aspiration goal to which the FEA is dedicated. We will pursue this goal through education and action, and we encourage the, the board, to, board to continue this journey as well. A huge part of achieving the goal of a more equitable school is ironically enough education. We need to learn about the experiences of precisely those who have been marginalized in society to develop the empathy that will guide our values and decision. And we need to learn about the topics in education most impacted by equity to develop, to, to develop the knowledge and skills to shape curriculum, policy, and school environment in a way that promotes equity for all. With that in mind, in, a, in addition to the professional development offered at Fenton, the FAA, FEA is pursuing its own continuing education on topics related to equity. We are arranging a series of tra training opportunities with the IEA and NEA, ranging from First Amendment issues and controversial topics in the curriculum to training to implicit bias and dealing with racism and discrimination in the classroom. We would like to invite the Board of Education to, co -lear to be co-learners with us in this journey. Our first training will occur on November 16th and we would like to arrange the time to present to you what we learned during the future sessions. In addition to the working on 
furthering our education in DEI topics. The FEA believes strongly in community outreach through dialogue and collaboration with community. We know that we can better understand the specific issues of equity, inclusion, and diversity that face Bensonville and Wooddale, the very equity issues that shape the lives of our students. To that end, FEA intends to support the efforts of Fenton Advocacy Network, a group created by the alumni that have addressed the board these last few months. We understand that they are arranging social media pages where residents and former students can begin submitting their equity stories in anticipation of a town hall meeting they are arranging in the near future. We look forward to hearing the stories and experiences of our community members at their town hall. And we sincerely hope the Board of Education will attend as well. The voices and experience of your constituents will no doubt provide valuable to you as you continue on your equity journey. In closing, we would like to reiterate and our encouragement to the board to take seriously the mission of creating an equitable learning environment for our students. Your words, your choices, and your actions have real consequences for our students. We therefore hope that you act in such a way that, that honors their exp experiences and safeguards their education. We love our kids and we sincerely hope you will join us on this equity journey. Thank you, Patrick Escobedo, FEA president. This next uh, public comment is from uh, Ms. Rebecca Bohm. Dear members of the Fenton High School Board and School Administration, as I shared previously, I am very concerned about the schedule to, for remote learning. We simply do not have enough class time for our teachers and students to interact. My daughter, who is a junior this year, has 12 hours of class time each week. To help you put this in perspective, she is literally spending more time each week at her part-time job than she is in the classroom. This is about half the classroom time assigned to a regular bell schedule. This is not acceptable. Our students deserve more. When the original remote schedule came out in August, my concern was with teachers only seeing students two days a week. They would not have enough time to, to teach, help struggling students, motivate average students, and challenge the stronger students. Something prior to the pandemic, I felt Fenton teachers did well. I spoke to administrator one, about this and she asked me to give it to give it some time. Now we are halfway through the semester and my concerns are validated. My daughter does not feel she is learning as much as she was uh, prior years at this point in the semester. She feels the little class time she is allotted is used to review what is expected to her and she is left uh, to teach herself the materials in many of her classes. I agree videos and group projects are great ways to learn, but they should be in addition to class lectures, not in place of. The following, uh, the regular bell schedule with shorter class periods, but meeting five days a week, like all the other schools in the areas are doing when they are in the remote learning plan. The teachers would have more time to use all these teaching uh, tools would give students more opportunities to ask questions as they come up and help both teachers and students build better relationships. I completely understand why you're uh, doing remote learning right now and completely expect to finish this semester remote and quite possibly start next semester remote. So my desire is to develop a plan that maximizes student success. We have so much time with current schedule with no classes on Monday, classes not starting until 10 a.m. and students in some classes not starting school until one, one, one in afternoon, some days. Right now, every day from 9 a.m. to 9 a.m., I'm sorry, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. is dedicated to parents being able to schedule meetings with teachers. I am curious how many meetings are actually scheduled. Aren't, aren't most families at Fenton dual income? Those most, thus most parents are working at this time and not able to speak to teachers. If we started the day at eight, eight o'clock like the regular bell schedule and had classes on Monday and that alone would give us 16 additional hours each week to focus on class time. I know and understand that everyone is working hard and doing the best to create an atmosphere where students can find success. I, I just do not feel that we are giving the teachers or students enough time to accomplish what that with the current schedule. My hope is that a remote schedule can be altered to reflect the bell schedules and take place five days a week, like a regular school day, school year, allowing students to stay in the safety of their home and getting the quality education Fenton is known for. Sent uh, by Rebecca Bone. Thank you. I heard 
Uh, this third one is uh, Mr. Mr. Marshall Subak. Dear friend, Board of Education members, this is Marshall Subak again. I am sure you are getting tired of hearing from me. Uh, I am again requesting that you work on improving the remote learning plan to include more instruction from teachers on a daily basis, as it is likely that Fenton will be in remote setting for an extended period of time. It is, it is the perfect time to pivot and improve the current remote plan. From my parent, from my parent teacher conferences, it appears that the world languages, math and science are the subjects that are struggling struggling the most and falling behind with the current remote plan. The teachers I spoke to were all open to upgrading the current remote plan. The teachers want to teach and they are willing to adapt their lesson plans to meet with the students more than one to two days a week. Under the current remote plan, the students are teaching themselves. That is simply not right. This is not a this is no valid reason for the students not to see each other, see each of their teachers each day. The administration and the board needs to revise the current plan that allows, a, that allows for daily instruction from teachers. When it is safe, the plan should allow for limited amounts of students to come in the building on a limited basis for classes like world languages and science labs that need in-person instruction. We're going to allow students in the building for sports, but not academics. The students at Hinsdale Central Schools were going to school in person for one week straight, then remote for, then remote for the other three weeks of the month, basically running the school at 25% capacity. Maybe Fenn students could come in at after hours to take an exam in person with, with social distancing. Maybe Spanish three is taught in person one day a week. There are safe ways to get limited students in the school on a limited basis. The administration should be showing the board what other surrounding schools are doing and seeing what works and what does not work. It's time for Fenton to, uh, to think about, to think outside the box, sitting silent and not changing is not getting it done. Based on the above, I am requesting the following from the, from the board. One, direct the staff to amend the remote plan that incorporates students seeing each of their teachers every day, five days a week. Two, direct staff to draft a plan that can have limited students in the building for certain classes, including world languages, science, science exper experiments and exams, which can be incorporated, incorporated when it is safe. Three, have the teacher's responses to survey released to the public. Thank you. The fourth comment is from Jessica Bangle. My name is Jessica Bangle. I am a 2016 Fenton alum and my pronouns are she, her. I want to thank all of you. If, if it were not for the July board meeting that sparked and emulated controversy, complacency, and contradiction regarding a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, we alumni would probably not be here. Furthermore, I am apologetic that some of you, you refuse to, the empathet to, to, to be empathetic to your marginalized students. Some feel true terror where, when in the presence of police simply due to their skin color and other feel immutable rejection from their parents simply due to their sexual preference. The list goes on. The impenetrable fear is, is some of our black, brown, and LGBTQIA plus and undocumented students everyday, everyday lives on top of being students. They are, they are their race, gender, sexual preference, and immigration status before being students. Refusing to acknowledge their identities in your statements is unacceptable. Moreover, Fenton is not immune to racism. The board claims to have already implemented the right type of equity work, but if current students and recent graduates can speak to the hate and prejudice seen or felt at Fenton now, the problem isn't solved. Although we, we must concede visually the equity box is being checked, the policies inherently are not effective. In the last meeting and equity presentation, spoke of numerous partnership and wide array of equity training the staff has done. Now I must challenge the board. How many of those partnerships satisfied 
our demands we presented last month. Did they promote DIE training for your students? Did you create a DIE committee that includes the students and the community? Did you consider the diversity and inclusion statement? The answer is no. However, many of our demands do not cost money and seek only the investment of your time. Yet, we are still ignored. Although your current partnership lacked the presentation of your community, we want to extend to you an opportunity to partner with us, your constituents, to fill the gap. We started with a petition of, of about 600 signatures calling for a discussion to implement a diversity action plan. However, we are creating a plan. However, we are creating a platform for students, parents, alumni, and community members to share their stories and testaments to racism, oppression, and prejudice experienced at Fenton. This can be accessed at the Fenton Advocacy Network Instagram and Facebook pages. Please direct messages, either accounts, with your incident of discrimination at Fenton. A link to a survey will also be made public for those that do not use either Facebook or Instagram. This will... This will later be shared publicly at a virtual town hall meeting. We're inviting you, the board, to be present to the future town hall meeting to vocalize your testament. Your support is in, invaluable to us, and we need your assistance to implement a diversity action plan so that the future Fenton graduates will not feel as their, their misfortune is the product of our inaction. Thank you. Fifth um, public comment. Um, Good evening, my name is Jamie Menard. I use she, her pronouns and I graduated Fenton in 2018. After months of meetings, after months of meetings and public comments, it is clear the board's decision on the equity statement was not taken lightly by the community members. After such, uh, after much outcry and multiple comments, you, the Board of Education still decides to ignore, ignore this issue. Equity is an important ongoing topic not a quick statement to be voted on once and forgotten about. Listening and respecting the public's opinions and the stories is essential to moving Fenton forward to becoming a school that ensures an equitable experience for all its students. There are many easy ways to pro provide the public you care about this topic. Adopt a similar equity statement the Fenton e Educational Association created as the dis, as the as the distract as the distract equality statement that lists different marginalized groups, create a diversity, equity, inclusion committee that uh, consists of board members, students, staff, and community members, and have this group be led by the students and staff. Continue to seek out diversity, equity, and inclusion training to remind the, to remind and reinforce what was learned in the last retreat. We recognize and appreciate steps taken in the past to address discrimination and equity at Fenton. However, what has been done in the past has simply not been enough. The Fenton Teacher Association recognized the importance of acting quickly, thoughtfully and powerfully when it comes to issues of diversity and discrimination. They assured students that no matter what identities they, they associate with, the FAA will work towards a more equitable environment. They are an example to be followed. At the last board meeting, administration shared information about different student groups to our support, to, to offer support at Fenton, such as the Black Student Union. So it is obvious Fenton understand the importance of supporting students who identify as a minority. Why can't you? The Board of Education understands the negative impact of refusing to acknowledge various marginalized groups could have on students. Fenton should strive to do better. Thank you. The sixth public comment. Hello, my name is Minister Xavier Pete. I am a graduate of the great class of 2015. The definition of inclusion is the practice and policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, such, such as those who, physic, who, who have physical or mental disabilities and members of other minority groups. Everyone has a desire to be included and feeling included. It is our job as leaders in our communities and, and respective industries to, to be open and accepting for all. The everyday struggle that people face, be, face being seen as different and odd is hard enough without the support and backing of the leaders that have been given authority over them. While sitting 
as the, stu uh, as the student body vice president, president at Northern Michigan University, I was taught that when you, are, when you are voted into a position of leadership or influence, one of the biggest responsibilities is to advocate for those that you represent. This board and school administration have failed to do that. When I was a student, I had, the, I had many pleasant memories by time here at Fenton. When I attended this school, we had a supportive and caring administration. There was never a time when a club team went somewhere to compete and administrator or administrator weren't there to support. The Fenton I knew was all almost like a family. Administration took the time to get to know the students by name. When this new administration came, the care and support went in out the window. I suspect that's also where the compassion of teachers and students went as well. And missed the current uh, affliction we faced as a country. The last thing I, I wanna hear is all lives matter. Well, I absolutely agree, all lives indeed matter. All lives are not the ones being targeted right now. The minority students and staff at Fen Fenton School wanted the community that they come to every day to understand and sympathize with them during a time when they feel rejected by the majority of the country. As a community of educators, administrators, and us as a town must like never before not divide, but instead support and rally around those that have been attacked in this current climate. I, I am appalled as an African-American alumni to hear the comments that that were said by some of the board members regarding the inclusion statement. It is my deepest hope that the board will stand up for and stand by their staff and students that need them in, the, in this divisive time that we are facing as a nation. I'm going to leave you with this scripture, 1 Peter 4, 8, 11, uh, MSG, most of, all, most of all, love each other as, as if your life depend on it. Love makes up for practically anything. Be quick to give a meal to the hungry, a bed to the homeless, cheerfully. Be generous with the different things God gave you, passing them around so all get in on it. If words, let it, let it be God's words. If it helps, let it be God's hearty help. That, that way God bright presence will be evident in everything through Jesus. Thank you for listening. Seven comment. Greeting. My name is Emma Butts. I am a 2016 alumni of Fenton. For the, for, for the past four years, I have been actively studying special education at Illinois State University. In addition to receiving my letter of approval in early childhood education and English as a second language education, I would like to share with a statistic with you. According to the Fenton Community High School Report Guard, 71.8% of Fenton current students are POC. 71.8% of Fenton students are being put in a position to experience more acts of racism, discrimination, and hate. This means that 71.8% of Fenton students are being uh, directly or indirectly affected by the microaggressions of all the individuals not equipped to serve under their diverse population. Our demands includes mandatory equity training among all staff members. Current and, rel and relative pro problems involving just and inequity should be identified, addressed, and actively resolved using research-based methods. Actively answering the question, our POCs need are being recognized and met should at the top of should at the top of any prior list. Active attempts should be made uh, in providing POC with the platform to present their, their point of view, stories, concerns, demands, and so on. It is important to note that our several demands cost no money. There are various professional, well-educated individuals specializing in diversity training that would be willing to step in and moderate a plan for Fenton. We are simply asking board members, leadership staff, and administration in position of power to reflect upon the their own bias and microaggressions before making comments and decisions that would affect POC. With this being said, the option to choose the path of increased representation and training is entirely based on your willingness to do the right thing for our community. You simply cannot say, we are responsive to residents' concern and operate in a fiscally responsible and efficient manner. At this point in time, because you are you have not taken our concerns or demands seriously. We will not be silenced. We will not. We will be heard. Our community deserves to be held with high regards and pride. 
continuing to to dismissing this prominent public outreach would be shameful and cold. Let me leave you with this statement by Sonia Sotomayor. Until you have equal education, we will not have an equal society. Thank you for your time. That was the end of uh, the public comments. All right, <clears throat> thank you, James. Uh, thank you for reading those. And uh, thank you all to, to all those that uh, submitted those comments. Um, now we move on to the District 100 informational items. Uh, James. Sure. Jim, if you, yep. Okay. Next slide, please, Jim. Let me get my notes here as well. All right, this is a uh, equi audit update. Uh, first up in our uh, District 100 informational item. Next slide, please. Nope, go back. I'm sorry, Jim. Okay, just, just to reiterate, we, we will continue to tell our equity journey here at Fenton. Our equity uh, journey is rich and longstanding. Tonight, we will describe two more important milestones in our equity journey, Fenton's equity audit and equal opportunity schools. Both presentation will be uh, in video format. The first video is about Fenton's equity audit, which was facilitated by Dr. Uh, Dr. Dubiel, Director of DuPage Regional Office of Education, Executive Director of Equity and Professional Learning last year, fall of 2019. Our district equity leadership team, the DELT, composed of staff and administrators, along with students and parents, played an important role in the audit, Dr. Dubiel will describe the process of the audit and the next step. The second video describes our equity journey with Equal Opportunity Schools, or EOS. The, present, the presenter is our division leader, Kate Ward. Our journey with EOS started in 2014. Let's show the first video, Jim. Good evening. My name is Yvette Dubiel. I am the Executive Director of Equity and Professional Learning for the DuPage Regional Office of Education. This presentation is an overview of the equity audit conducted for Fenton High School District 100 during school year 2019-2020. The targeted discussion points will cover the purpose and process of an equity audit, the goals of an equity audit, the findings and recommendations, the next steps. It's important to first establish some common language and understanding regarding equity. Equity is disrupting the inequities deeply embedded in educational systems. By disrupting these inequities, it advances anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-classism, and additional forms of marginalization upon historically disenfranchised groups of people. Now, there are a variety of definitions that exist regarding equity. One that resonates often is recently adopted by the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. They state that equity is when educational policies, practices, interactions, and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people such that each individual has access to, can meaningfully participate and make progress in high quality learning experiences that empowers them towards self-determination and reduce disparities and outcomes regardless of individual characteristics and cultural identities. In other words, everything we see is with an equity lens from policies, practices, interactions, and resources. And to do this work requires representation, construction, and responsiveness to all people that work within an educational institution. This work is too big to do solely alone. It requires meaningful participation, high quality expectations, empowering of individual identities and reducing disparities that perpetuate inequities. In moving forward with an equity audit, our goal is to determine 
the areas of strengths, as well as needed improvements to advance equity for each student. The equity audit is a fact-finding process that aids in identifying gaps and leads to tangible recommendations to address and mitigate inequities. The process of an equity audit is a year-long undertaking that has five phases to it. During this process, a partnership is made between the district and myself in collecting critical data and determining focus group questions of essential community stakeholders. This five-phase process looks like the following. During phase one of the equity audit, the district assembles a district equity leadership team known as DELT. During that time, DELT completes a needs assessment to determine where they are in the equity realm on 10 major components against a given rubric. The results of that needs assessment is in the equity audit report. During phase one, the DELT group also determines the direction of the audit with the, selecting the phase two and phase three. Phase two is the selection and the gathering and the providing of data. So DELT receives a long list of data considerations and determines during phase one what data they will actually provide during the phase two of the process to be included in the audit and be analyzed with an equity lens. Some data does not apply to them, some would apply to them, depending on the organization. During phase one, Dell also receives example questions to ask the different stakeholder groups. The different stakeholders are students, community members, meaning family, parents, caretakers, guardians, and staff. They receive a bank of questions as samples of what can be asked. They can determine which questions they prefer, which ones they don't. They can completely come up with questions on their own. All of this is accomplished during phase one. After phase one, phase two and phase three occur simultaneously. So while the district is busy gathering the wide range of data to be included in the equity audit, the focus groups will also be conducted, and they've been conducted by me of the different stakeholders. Following phase three, phase four, and phase five of the audit also occur simultaneously. Phase four is a data analysis with myself and the team, both quantitatively and qualitatively, and phase five are, is the report writing. The recommendations that are research-based and customized on the district's needs and resources. This report is then sent to the district to ensure all accuracies without making any edits to the recommendations and a final report is submitted. So what is the goal of this equity audit? It's to identify a non-exhaustive list of findings based on the data gathered and analyzed. It provides research-based recommendations geared towards systemic equity to benefit all students. That systemic action, accountability, and metrics is going to be achieved through evidence of applying and advancing equity lens through a plan. All of this equity audit work that devoted a lot of time, resource, critical quantitative and qualitative information all leads to a long-term plan. That long-term plan is the Equity Implementation Plan, also known as the EIP. This EIP will have specific action, specific accountability, and specific metrics, again, quantitatively and qualitatively, to show evidence that we are, in fact, moving the equity needle forward as a district. This EIP has five major strands to it. Think of those major strands as goals, systems, teaching and learning, student voice, climate, culture, professional learning, family and community engagement. So in the EIP, these are the five major goals. And under each of these five major goals, there are several objectives that will be identified to meet these big lofty goals. 
some of the decision making and systems, for example, would be policies, processes, district wide impact. Teaching and learning would encompass curriculum, culturally responsive instruction, academic programs like honors, AP, English language learners, and special education. Student voice, climate, and culture will include discipline, extracurricular activities, SEL, trauma-informed, as well as climate and culture among the adults. Professional learning will have a continuum of PD regarding equity and social justice. And certainly, we cannot do this work isolated. We need our family and community to help us along this journey. So there'll be specific objectives related to family and community as agency. What were some of the data collected during the equity audit? Well, the quantitative data will range widely, but there was a request to include, and it was included, to have such data such like student demographics, standardized assessments, final grades, graduation rate, retention, staff endorsements, languages spoken by students, et cetera. And this data is included and then disaggregated further by race, gender, specialized populations, and the intersectionality of the same. What is that intersectionality? It is a combination of all of those socially constructed identities of race, gender, and specialized populations. For example, when requesting the discipline of students, it is often provided through race and gender separately, but an intersectionality allows us to look at it with a microscopic lens. In other words, taking a race within that discipline data and disaggregating it further by gender, and then maybe disaggregating further by specialized population for free and reduced lunch. The qualitative data and what that encompassed. For Fenton 100, a total of 21 focus groups were carried out and a total of 121 people participated. Thank you to all the people that were part of the focus groups. The next step is just as critical, and that is working with the district equity leadership team to begin the process of putting an EIP together. DELT will look at the recommendations in the audit. We'll decide which of those objectives to adopt this year, next year, which ones would be repeated objectives for multiple years, what new objectives could we include in the EIP based on what the district is currently working on? What template and metrics will we utilize as evidence to show we are in fact making gains in regards to equity? We will also determine the different actionable objectives to include long-term and how we can make sure we tap in to our community to drive this work forward. It should be noted that in the recommendations I make, I often suggest to districts to not adopt all recommendations at once. In fact, many of the recommendations based on the objectives cannot be adopted because of allocation of resources. They may be limited. The allocation that some of the work is going to take time to gather information. But it is important to eventually adopt all the objectives. A reminder, it is not exhaustive. I know my colleagues tonight will talk a little bit more about next steps for district equity leadership team. But I want to just take a moment to say a very big thank you for all the individuals that were part of the district equity leadership team. I am the steward in helping to conduct the equity audit, but it is really the work of the district equity leadership team, their experience, their expertise, 
that not, not, not only drives the direction of the audit, but the very tedious process, comprehensive and robust planning that takes place in conducting the audit and then the work that follows. So a huge thank you to all. And I apologize it could not be there tonight. I look forward to the continued work with your district. Thank you. So board, you met uh, Dr. Yv Yvette Dubiel, where we are really excited to work with her as well as the Regional Office of Education. Again, I wanted to uh, send my regards and thank you to our uh, district equity leadership team or DELT, uh, composed of staff and administrators. Uh, they've done a lot of work. You can see this is a year process, a lot of uh, uh, meetings and gathering of information. Uh, before I uh, give, hand it over to Michelle and Jovan for the next steps for the DELT team, um, it, you can see her expertise. Uh, uh, Yvette has been doing this for a while now. Um, so she was hired by the Regional Office of Education uh, a couple years ago. Uh, seeing the need that uh, that there needs to be some equity work done here in DuPage. So we are very, uh, very fortunate to have Yvette here in the district. And as you know, uh, once I heard that there was an equity audit, uh, which is not always pleasant for a district, uh, uh, exactly because we want to change curriculum and policies and change we the, change the ways we do things here to make sure we, we serve every single student in respect of uh, and, and loving and just way. Um, and this is our this is our beacon in regards to our equity, inclusion, and diversity. And I'm really looking forward to this as well as the, my colleagues and the teachers here at Fenton. Michelle and Yovan, next step please in, in regards to the DELT and, uh, and with working with Dr. Dubiel. Sure. Do you want me to jump in first, Yvonne? All right, go ahead. Okay, so um, what we've done is scheduled a series of meetings um, now with Dr. Dubiel and our DELT um, for second semester to really dive into that EIP, the Equity Implementation Plan. Um, we'll be meeting um, with that entire team about eight times for half days um, during the second semester, starting in January. Um, and then in actually before January, we'll be meeting with the DELT team um, two times um, on our Monday professional development days um, to simply bring the team back together. We're going to dive into some case studies about diversity and equity in the classroom, as well as start to brainstorm how does the remote setting now even contribute further to um, our equity uh, mission and journey. Um, so those were both recommendations from Dr. Dubiel of what we can do before we go ahead and get started in January with her as her calendar was um, tied up until then. But um, I think those are great first steps for this semester to bring the team together and start to learn one another's perspectives and um, start some training and then um, actually dive into the implementation plans during second semester. Yovan, did you want to add anything? No, that's it. Michelle covered it all. So thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. So we're looking forward to that. We will keep you posted. Uh, the next video is in regards to EOS or Equal Opportunity School, um, an organization that uh, we worked, worked with since 2014 um, in regards to equity and the curriculum, um, in particular in our advanced placement program. The presenter is our 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 division leader, uh, Mrs. Uh, Kate Ward. And Jim, if you could play the video. Good evening, it's Kate Ward. And I'm here to give you a quick update on Fenton's continuing journey with EOS or Equal Opportunity Schools. My goal for tonight is to remind you a little bit about EOS's mission and their program's yearly process. To summarize Fenton's journey with EOS so far, to explain a little bit about Fenton's unique approach to the program and to share what we're up to with them this year. Equal Opportunity School mission is to ensure that students of color and low-income students have equitable access to America's most academically intense high school programs and succeed at the highest levels. 
So far, EOS has collaborated with over 600 schools across 30 states in the United States, leading to the enrollment of tens of thousands of students in rigorous courses such as AP or IB. When a school partners with EOS, they encourage them to participate in a yearly cycle. Right now, we're in stage one. This stage begins in the fall with students and teacher surveys. Every October, all 9th through 11th graders take the fall interest survey where they share their interests, success and struggles in schools, and career and college goals and aspirations. They also have the opportunity to share the names of adults at Fenton that they trust. At the same time students are taking the survey, all teachers, counselors, and social workers also take a survey where they're able to identify students from their current rosters that they believe have the potential to take on more challenging coursework in the future. The data from those two surveys is combined and reports on each student are generated. And EOS identifies students that have AP potential based on the, the answers that they gave in their own survey, the staff recommendations, and also preloaded data such as GPA and test scores. The second step of the cycle is the trusted adult conversation. In December, prior to registration for the next school year, teachers, administrators, and support staff that were identified by students as trusted adults reach out to the students that were identified by EOS as having AP potential to talk to them about the courses they're planning to take for the next year, giving them special encouragement to think about enrolling in more challenging courses. What we have found is that oftentimes students just need that extra nudge from an adult that they trust to take the leap into a more advanced course. In the spring, we go on to step three. In the spring, another survey is administered to all current AP students to get their feedback on what works and what didn't work for them in their AP classes. This survey questions them about teaching practices, about resources that are offered by the school, and even questions them about their sense of belonging among their peers and their views of themselves in their AP course. The final step, step four, is time for the EOS team to dig in, go through all that data, and do some serious planning for how to improve the cycle for the next year. To be quite honest with you, step four isn't really a one-shot deal. It's something that Fenton's EOS team engages in throughout the entire year, um, engaging with the data that is given from all of these different EOS surveys to make sure that we are targeting all of the students that we need to to ensure success. As you all know, Fenton started this partnership in 2014 with EOS, seeing the opportunity to expand access for so many of our students in our building. In 2018, EOS offered an additional layer of support for schools who are well into their journey called the EOS Equity Labs. In the labs, experienced EOS schools meet four times a year to delve into deep equity work and to share where they have been successful and where they still need to do some work. Fenton has found engagement in the equity labs to be one of the most rewarding opportunities that EOS has offered. As you all know, in 2019, Fenton was named AP District of the Year, which really showed us that all of this work that we have been doing with EOS was certainly having an impact. However, this work continues. In 2020, we are starting our sixth cycle with EOS. We are entering our third round of EOS equity labs, and this year, for the first time, our team is sharing the tremendous learning we have done with the labs by offering a series of equity talks for all adults in the building. Each school that partners with EOS designs their own structures to support the EOS efforts. At Fenton, the bulk of the work around EOS comes out of the EOS committee which is a team of teachers, counselors, and administrators that meets bi-weekly to plan all EOS outreach and activities. Our second layer is the AP cohort, which is the team of all AP teachers in the building. This group meets quarterly to discuss AP culture, best practices, and how to support one another and our students in finding success in the AP classroom. Finally, our newest addition, is called AP Ambassadors. This is where we're giving students a role and some leadership in this process. In this group, experienced AP students give advice, support, and work on building community in AP classrooms for all AP students.
So some of the initiatives that have come out of the data and um, talking to students that have been in the AP classroom, things that we've hosted in the past have been AP Parents Nights, AP Summer Boot Camp, AP Student Lunches, and AP Experience Student Panels. And those last two, that's where we're starting to see our students take leadership. We're continuing with the idea of student leadership with this year, student-led study groups. So this is an initiative that has come from AP students and is being led by AP students. They have proposed running study sessions during remote and then eventually once we get back to school in person, that they will run study sessions for their colleagues and for their peers in order to help them be prepared and uh, share their knowledge and expertise with them. We are also starting our third year of the EOS Equity Lab. So we have a new team of counselors, teachers, and administrators that are going to participate in this incredible work. And then finally, and maybe most exciting, is that our EOS team is sponsoring, uh, sponsoring a series of equity talks. So in response to societal and racial tensions that surfaced this summer, the EOS committee felt the need to respond and put into action the learning and training that we experienced in the equity labs. Our team has committed to hosting a series of equity talks for administration, certified and support staff at Fenton, centered around issues such as race, white privilege, and systemic racism. Our goal is to provide a safe and open forum for adults in our building to discuss these important topics, learn and grow with one another, and consider the profound impact that topics such as these have on our student body. I'm excited to report that over 70 members of the Fenton community participated in our first two talks. So these are just a few examples of the way that our partnership with EOS has positively affected the Fenton community. Thank you for your continued support in our EOS efforts. If you have any questions about the programs, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Kate, wherever you're at, on the other side of the screen. A uh, great job there, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Dubiel, if you're watching this for the previous video. So there's a lot of work we're doing in regards to equity. Really excited about the equity talk. Uh, I've attended two and working on the third one, so a lot of good stuff in regards to, to that. Any questions with the videos, comments? No, I'd just like to say uh, thank you for the reminder on the progress this district has made over the last several years. And it's a true testament to uh, Fenton's commitment to equity, uh, diversity and inclusion. And just great job, great job on the progress of uh, EOS. Okay, we'll continue to, uh, to move forward in regards to that. Uh, just real quick, just uh, some COVID updates. Um, as you guys know, the DuPage Public Health Department has placed DuPage County in substantial community. Transmission has been all over the news. Um, and uh, we communicated that to you. Uh, that, that news came out on Monday. This is due to, due to the surge of COVID cases in DuPage. Uh, this picture right here, you've seen it every month, is the DuPage uh, COVID uh, dashboard. Uh, it, gives, it provides you some um, different me metrics uh, in regards to COVID. Next slide, please. So we're in substantial community transmission. This has caused it, as you can see here, here are the COVID cases in DuPage by date. And you've seen it spiking up. It was going down back in June and um, it's made a steady climb up. Next slide, please. This next slide is basically uh, the youth age group. Um, and you've, been see you've, you've seen this every month. It's the 15 and 19 year old that's, that hits those uh, high marks. Uh, in regards to COVID cases, we've got to be very careful. Uh, you can see the, the middle schoolers, 5 to 14, um, made a peak there in, in, in late September. And 0 to 4 seems to be consistent. There's some peaks and valleys there as well. But that's the youth group. Next slide, please. Here's a bar graph of the previous slide, just by numbers, just a basic bar graph. And you can see the numbers there, 15 to 19. Uh, in DuPage, 1,600 kids, um, middle row 5 to 14, 803, and 306 from 0 to 4. You could see the, the trend there of um, who's catching COVID among the youth groups. This slide right here it basically is uh, COVID cases by municipalities. Naperville, Addison, and West Chicago are among the highest. Bensonville has 850 COVID cases, a population of 18,000, and Wooddale, 449. Um, 
cases with a population of 14,000. Um, uh, Bensonville used, like I say, every month, Bensonville was uh, in the top three at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Uh, it has moved itself further and further with proper mitigation, but there's still cases here. Next slide, please. This one is death by municipalities. Um, Bloomingdale, Westmont, and Elmers have the highest numbers. Bensonville, 17, Wooddale, 11. Next slide, please. You've seen this. These are more metrics that shows due pages in the substantial transmission of COVID. And if you look at the third column I showed last month, this is all, look at the arrows there in the third column, the trend. I still even have it here. I don't know if you can see this, but this was last month, last board meeting. All the arrows were going down. Okay, now it's all that's going up. Uh, the projection is that the arrows will continue to go up. And that blue arrow there, uh, the first one in the trend uh, projection is that's going to be orange next next week or the following week. Uh, so as you can see, as I go over this COVID um, update, I'm also putting out pictures for, for the board as well as our viewers to continuously wash their hands, wash their distance, and uh, uh, wear a mask. This one is how to take off a mask uh, properly. Next slide, please. Okay, let's bring it home. Uh, Bensonville here pulled this data, I believe, yesterday. Uh, Seven-day rolling uh, COVID positivities at 8.82%, and 14 days is 9.31. We know that is in the substantial um, framework uh, uh, metrics. Wooddale, 9.06, seven-day trend, uh, and the 14-day 14, uh, 14 is at 8.64. Um, promotion there of, of do not wear your mask this way. Uh, Illinois Department of Public Health. So we went from micro to a little bit more macro state level. This is the last 10 days. Uh, 10 days ago, it was uh, we were averaging about 2,700. It jumped up to 4,342 as of today. I thought there was a 5,001 a um, couple days ago. I must have missed it. Okay, on this data, but the trend is there. All right, next slide. Jimmy jumping a little ahead of me, but that's fine. Uh, substantial co uh, community transmission. What does it mean for school district in DuPage? Okay, um, some, some school district in, in DuPage transitioned to fully remote learning already. Naperville, Elmhurst, uh, Wooddale, uh, uh, just today has transitioned. Some are staying put. If they have hybrid, they're, they're, they're watching the data, but uh, some school districts are sticking with hybrid and um, hoping that the numbers will go down. What does it mean for Fenton? This one I know. We're going to double down. That's the key word here. We're going to double down on the three W's. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. We're going to double down in cleaning. We're going to double down in disinfecting. We are doing well here. The, the mitigations that we, we follow the guidelines from CDC and IDPH, we should hold it off. But as you know, we're in this bubble. Around that bubble, if there's a lot of COVID cases, those cases are knocking on our door as well. So we got to double down. What else do we know? We're going to continue to support, support our students and teachers with Remote Learning 2.0. We're going to continue bringing uh, small groups of students in the building, okay, like we have started, because they need the support and need the assistance. We're going to continue athletics and marching band activities on the playing and practice fields in the parking lots. Everything is outside. They're not inside, they're outside, okay? Um, and lastly, we're gonna double down on our priorities, okay? And you guys know what that is, is safety, learning, and communication. We, that's been our priority since last March. So who are the students that we're bringing on campus and uh, supporting in the building? Um, we, you've seen this list. We've added a little bit. I think one more here. The folks we're bringing indoors are ELLs, okay, English language learners, some special ed students, uh, net sex uh, special ed students are in the building. Students who are uh, having issues with connectivity uh, and internet are coming in the building, small groups, another small group of ninth graders um, that need support and students uh, that need support and engagement. Um, and with, with homework and stuff like that are also coming in. We also have, have a supervised remote learning, which is basically, uh, hey, look, I wanna do my remote learning in the building. Uh, I want a quiet space. I want some Wi-Fi and connectivity 
and I just need to to get out the house sort of sort of thing. And lastly, we have night school. That's basically a fancy word for tutoring. Uh, so students that could get that support after school. Second group of students that we're bringing on campus outdoors are athletics and marching band. Um, uh, and I'll show you a picture of that in a bit here. Uh, there are outside, you shout out to our athletic director, Todd Becker, Jovan, our principal, and all the folks that put this together is trying to put the pieces together, wording in a practice, which field, which parking lot. So it's very complicated, but uh, Todd has done a great job in putting that together. And I cannot forget Mr. Koss as well. Uh, lastly, clubs are either outside or remote. Next slide, please. Here's a little picture there. There you go. Uh, uh, parking lot band jam. Okay. We have uh, girls cross country. And as you know, we had a drive-in movie for seniors. Next slide. Uh, some learning in the classroom. There's a picture up there of remote learning with uh, Mr. Drellishar in an automotive uh, via Zoom or Google Meets. And we have groups of students. Uh, this one on the left is engagement. And the one on the right is supervised remote learning where students can just come in, study, get their work done, uh, and so forth. Next slide. So that's where we're at with COVID. Um, we got to keep our hands, hands uh, our fingers crossed on that one. I've learned of a, a death of, of someone here in, in, in Bensonville. So our hearts and uh, our, our prayers are, are out to them. Um, this thing, we, we got to get a better handle of this. Um, and um, we, we got to follow the mitigation steps that's being pushed by a, a CDC and IDPH. Now we're going to transition to parent survey. Our director of curriculum, Mrs. Uh, Papa Nicolau, will take this along with our, our principal, uh, Jovan Lazarevich, and uh, happy um, uh, <laughs> principal month for Jovan. Jovan <laughs> A great job his third year here. Very, very fortunate to have him here in the district as well as Michelle. Thanks, James. Right, it's thanks. my fourth year, but that's okay. Fourth year, okay. It felt like three. <laughs> that's how quick it's going. It's so it feels like only three. <laughs> okay, three well, regular thanks. years and a COVID year. How about that? Yeah. All right. Thanks, James. Um, hi, board. It's nice to see you all. Um, I, we continue to survey and seek feedback um, about how remote learning is going for our students and our families. And we continue to um, take phone calls, um, look at survey data, um, talk formally and informally with our teachers and our students, and um, we continue to learn and grow. So um, what I'm going to share with you tonight is a summary of the results of our Remote Learning 2.0 parent survey. Um, we opened that survey from September 24th through October 6th. Um, we had a total of 508 responses. Um, we surveyed in both English and Spanish. Um, on our English survey, we had approximately, well, not, we had 429 responses. And on our Spanish survey, we had 79 responses. So what we've done in our summary today is collated all of those responses together to provide one whole graph instead of you know, looking at both of those um, response summaries separately. We had about 32 questions. We'll go through um, a number of those, um, but we won't go through every single question. So if you have um, any for further questions, um, you can let us know and we can dig into the data a little bit further. I'll talk about next steps at the end. So. Um, the, the look at this data um, it won't stop here. It will continue to dig deeper and deeper as we continue on this journey. Um, our areas of focus are the same areas of focus that we asked our students. I presented with you, or I'm sorry, Yovan presented with me last week or last month. Um, and these were the same areas of focus that we asked the students um, about their general experience, some questions about technology, their expectations, communication, learning, social emotional experiences, support, and the learning environment. So in their general experience, um, what we're hearing from parents when we ask how well is remote learning working for your child, um, you can see the aggregate of this um, 
the results here, it looks like 172 were kind of right in the middle. One um, is working very well, five is not working very well. So we kind of have a split um, consensus between the working, working and not working. It looks like uh, there's a little bit of a trend towards working um, over not working. Um, so that's the general experience. We continue to drill down and make sure that everybody has reliable internet access and devices at home. Um, we were pretty satisfied with this result. The students um, had a little bit different of a, a response. Um, they were at 56% for um, yes or always. Um, and we actually had some students say never. We, we, we have families that we didn't have any responses of um, you know, not having or never having reliable access. So um, we think that um, you know, the, some of the work that we're doing on that and through our technology department and through some of our special funding programs that we're able to support our community right now with, with technology. Um, so about how much time per week would you say your child is participating in learning outside of live connection classes? Um, we continue to drill down on this and try to better understand, you know, how much time outside of the live connections are, are they actually spending on work and homework? And um, looks like our it's pretty split. Um, if if you look at five to seven hours, about nineteen percent. Um, is being reported for that five to seven hour range, seven to nine hours, about 10%. Actually the more than 10 hours, I'm sorry, that's cut off, but that's just more than 10 hours. Um, we have about 17% or 18% of our families reporting that their students are spending more than 10 hours outside of the class time. Um, about the same percentage, zero to two hours and um, but the highest percentage is the three to five hours outside of class time. So it's really split. Um, how would you rate your child's ability to manage their overall workload? Um, so this ranges from one, they're finding it extremely difficult to manage to five. Um, they are finding many ways to manage. Sorry about that typo. Um, so it looks like most of the families are feeling like three, four, or five that they are willing to, um, I'm sorry, that they're finding ways to manage. Um, 123 and 116 are on that, um, on the side of managing um, their, their workload. So that's an interesting statement, uh, if we can go back, because um, obviously the amount of work that was done in the previous one, and then when you take a look at the students looks like many of them are managing to take care of that. So when you look at our numbers and um, when you look at like zero to two or even more than 10 hours, um, we don't have unfortunately specifics of like when they're actually doing it. We've heard stories of, you know, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, things like that. Um, but we do know that, um, you know, the students are, are saying that the workload is, is great, but as well that they are trying to manage and, and, uh, and finding ways to do that. So um, so it's an interesting dynamic when they say how much time it is versus the, the amount of workload and are they managing it, so. Yeah, the other thing to note is that on the student uh, question that paralleled this one, it was kind of a bell curve, um, not, not exactly, um, you know, leaning heavily towards finding ways to manage. If anything, it was that bell curve with a slight distribution with them having difficulty managing it. So the parents are feeling like the students are managing it better than maybe the students think they're managing it um, is what we're finding. Um, the workload in each of their class in the classes. So this is the parent's perception of how would you rate your child's workload in each of your classes. You can see our highest bar in all of the subject areas is just right. Um, there's a little lean towards the workload is a bit too much um, over, you know, being a little, a, a bit too little, um, but really the majority is saying this feels just right for my child in terms of the workload. 
which was interesting. Um, I don't have any comparison to the students on that. So on the learning, I feel that my child is receiving an adequate amount of face-to-face -face instruction from their teachers. Um, you can see we have kind of the, the largest response being that middle response right down the middle of the road and kind of a split between agreeing and disagreeing um, with maybe a slight a, a slight lean towards the agreement side. Um, but we definitely still have a large population of uh, parents who are saying that, that they don't think there's enough face-to-face -face time. Um, I'm saying that they do. Compared to last year, um, at this time, how would you rate how much your child is learning in their classes? Um, so, this one was an interesting one because the students survey primarily felt like their largest um, response bar was the um, about the same as last year with kind of an equal distribution between not as much or more than. Our families are seeing or our parents are seeing that, yes, you know, it's about the same as last year for the highest response, but that next highest response isn't far behind they're thinking, they're, they're seeing that it's not as much as last year, where our students kind of felt it was, an, a, a, um, you know, a, just about the same, and they were split between not as much and more. Um, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> um, so, sorry about that. Okay. For learning, yep. I feel that yep. my child is able to learn and get work done at home. Uh, mm -hmm. So obviously strongly disagree is to the left uh, and ones and strongly agree to the to five. So trending more that they strongly agree that their child is able to learn and get work done at home, um, which is similar to our, our, our uh, student survey as well. They, they feel like they can get the work done at home. So. Great. So we asked about communication. Do you feel like you're receiving an adequate amount of communication from your school's principals, deans, and other administrators? Um, so that's a pretty strong percentage, 79% feeling it's just the right amount. Um, but there is still about 15% that are feeling like they're getting less than what they needed. And, um, you know, still um, some you know, think maybe we're giving them a little too much. <laughs> um, and that's always the, the balance for us is like, we don't, you know, we try to over communicate, but um, in some cases that we don't want to agitate, but we are trying to over communicate as much as possible, but looks like we can do just a little bit better there. We ask about safety and how, um, how uh, the child feels um, in their remote learning environment. And we do see that most of our parents feel like the, the remote learning environment is safe for their child. But these are the types of survey responses that we go straight to the actual individuals and start reaching out. So we started reaching out on the sur student survey and now we reach out to um, the families on this one. Um, what, we, what we are finding in some of those is Either it was a misread question, or um, in some cases, it was just like they were breezing through certain parts. And it's good, though. We'd rather have situations where our students, it's false, right? Like, we want them to be safe, but we do have to follow up and, and um, investigate each one of those. And some of them just uh, answered the one or the two because they just don't like remote learning. So they were like, it's not, they don't like the remote learning. It's not that their child isn't safe. It's just they don't like remote learning and they wanted to reiterate to us that they don't like remote learning. So. Yeah, so we continue to follow up on those kinds of responses. So support, you know how to get help if you need it. Um, you know, the the parents are saying about 50% yes, um, another 30% yes, but only for certain things. And then about 17% are saying no. So we have to continue with our communication efforts on that, our parent academy uh, videos and um, continuing to help families understand where they can get help. Luckily our students, almost 76% of them 
said, yes, I completely understand where to get help. Another 20% of them said yes for certain things. So really under 5% of the students said they, they didn't know where to get help. So even if the parents aren't sure, it seems as though the students are sure about where to get help. So we, get, we just have to continue communicating systems of support and how things work now that we're in a remote setting. It's going to be a transition. I feel that my child would learn better if they were able to do remote learning while in the school building. So this is simply like still doing learning how it's happening, but if they were in the building and had presence in the building, would they be learning better? Um, so these are our responses for that. Um, oh no, go, you gotta go back. Yeah, it was a third, a third, a third, basically. Yeah, it was a third, a third, a third. And the, the students' responses were the same. A third, a third, a third. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So the final one about learning environment, if you had the choice, which learning environment would you prefer for your child at this time? Um, and like I said, I gave you the date range. This was back in late September, early October. Um, we'd anticipate that some of these responses will continue to shift and evolve as we learn more about the data. But at that point, we had about 31% saying fully remote, um, and then another 15% saying fully remote with some small groups of students coming in the building for specific supports, about 26% saying hybrid, 21% full, full in person, and 5% were still unsure at that point. So our next steps, um, and this is fully underway, the Highlander Institute is working with us with this data to um, disaggregate the data, kind of how Dr. Jubiel discussed um, with uh, race, ethnicity, gender, special population groups, like are we, are we hitting everybody equally? Is everybody, um, are there any discrepancies between um, subgroups? And um, we're also, taking a look at the whole of the responses, there were a lot of open-ended questions and they're taking a look at theming and really coding all of those open-ended questions for us um, and helping us then come back as a design team and say, okay, here's your remote learning plan. Here's your hybrid learning plan. What kind of adjustments, additions, or deletions do we have to make to those plans? Um, we have task forces in place, um, and we've actually already started some dialogue with them about this data, but once we get the Highlander data, we will be meeting with Highlander next Thursday. So um, we're excited to see what they've done with the comparison between our stakeholder groups. Um, then we will follow up with students and families who've provided concerning responses, like the safety um, concern or not having a suitable place to learn. And then we will continue to seek methods to reach the students and families who've not provided feedback. So we have some efforts going on in terms of focus groups and empathy interviews with families moving forward. Continue trying to find that empty seat and, and getting feedback from the families and the students that we haven't heard from. Anything else you have on? Oh, that was it. Thank you. Great, great summary there. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, board. Great job, uh, Yovan and Michelle. Um, as you can see, uh, the key point uh, I want the board to focus on is that, yeah, we took the survey and, and Michelle and Yovan uh, is working with Highlander to see how we can improve both our hybrid and, and remote plans as well. So we're always looking for ways to improve it. Um, as you know, we built, built Remote Learning 2.0 back in June from previous uh, uh, surveys from parents as well. So we continue to tweak it. Just a reminder, this is a pandemic. We've never seen nothing like this. Uh, Yovan never started in, in principal school. Michelle is not a sergeant director of curriculum. I've never seen it in, in the superintendency. So we are we are working hard as we can and we need to pivot and, and change and revise as we go along We're doing it in a systematic way, uh, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, in regards to that. Uh, in regards to supports, uh, this next video is from the National Honor Society, and Dr. Musman is the, uh, the club sponsor uh, for that uh, group of, of great students here. So this is a way how the National Honor Society assists students.
Hi, my name is Brianna Tellez and I am the president of the National Honor Society. The officers and I have worked really hard over remote learning to find and create community service opportunities for NHS students in turn to benefit the community and support the students of Fenton. We gather on a weekly basis to brainstorm ideas in order to enhance learning at home and to give back to the community as best that we can. Hello, my name is Daisy Kosia Garcia. I'm this year's NHS Vice President. Some things of myself and my fellow board members have been working on is essentially reinvent community services here. I'm more in charge of anything like hands-on, such as making cards for people in nursing homes, which we're hoping to expand much further on. I'm also in charge of this year of any remote assistance learning, which is essentially asking teachers if there's, if there's anything that us students can do to help them make remote learning run a lot smoother. And what we have done so far is like making videos for instructors in class and teachers also asking for input, which we're also hoping to expand much further. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kylie, Secretary of the National Honor Society this year. This year, I'm working in conjunction with Mrs. Ward to create AP Ambassadors and kind of revamp it. This year, we're looking at NHS students to be leaders in their AP classes and host review sessions outside of the normal remote learning hours, as well as help them prep and be a resource for their peers. This way, everyone can feel successful and get the help they need in their This AP semester, classes. I've been working with the counselors and the teachers to provide a way for NHS students to become peer tutors. This is a community service opportunity for any NHS student that's interested. And it also provides a way for students to get the help that they need from somebody that they might feel more comfortable working with. I've created a Google form for students to fill out so that way they can put exactly what subjects and assignments they might need help with. And then upon receiving their responses, I'll be matching them up with an NHS student that also feels comfortable giving help on that subject. And overall, I think it's a great way for students to still connect with one another during the period of remote learning and still get the help that they need. Hi, my name is Anna Mycourt, and so far as the NHS parliamentarian, I've been in charge of coordinating the translation services at Benton. So far, I've been successful in doing so, and many teachers have had various documents translated, and students have received the community service hours for doing so. I've also helped brainstorm a list of virtual community service options for students, and I've been answering any questions students may have about NHS and led a general meeting. I'm so excited to see what the rest of the year has in store for us, and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Hi, my name's Imani, and I'm in charge of the Hunger Action Committee for the Fenton National Honor Society. In the Hunger Action Committee, we help with food pantry events that we have in our community. My committee holds food distributions every month at Wooddale and Bensonville schools, pre-COVID-19. Due to COVID-19, we haven't been able to do much this year. Hopefully we can get back to donating our time to give food to those in need. Thank you. The officers and I will continue to provide resources available to all students, like the screencast, tutoring, and translation to make sure that they're being successful at home. In addition, we are constantly looking for more community service ideas that would connect the students to the community and encourage leadership and character. Thank you. Thank you, NHS. Uh, this next slide here, um, I'm sorry, uh, I want to thank the NHS again, um, and um, there's going to be great work. It's it's peer-to-peer -peer, uh, tutoring and, and assistance. I'm really glad that this is in play. Um, um, it just shows how wonderful and amazing our students are in regards to giving back. So th once again, thank you, NHS. This next slide right here is uh, we received another FOIA from the smart procurement company. We they do this every three months in regards to uh, to know our purchase order and our billing statements. So we have uh, um, submitted their FOIA requests and um, we're good to go with that. Next slide, please. Next slide. All yours, uh, President Wiedemann. You're on mute, Paul. Paul, you're on mute. Paul, you're on mute. Paul, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry, took a few tries there. 
Thanks. Okay, we move on now to the consent agenda. Uh, do we have any questions or comments regarding the uh, consent agenda? All right, if not, um, may, I, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? I will make the motion, Paul. Okay, thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? So moved. Second. Uh, thank you, Leo. Leo. Uh, Mary, roll call, please. Peyton Howell? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Rago? Keep going, Mary. Ting Po Pong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, the motion has passed. Um, now we move on to the discussion action items. Uh, the first item is um, presentation, James, a presentation by Rob Grossi. Rob Grossi uh, presented during the finance uh, facilities meeting of uh, projections. Um, and uh, he, he is unable to present at the regular board meeting. Our CSBO, uh, Bruce Martin, will take that role. Okay, thank you, Mr. Antango. J just a couple of brief comments. I won't go through the whole presentation, but um, just to uh, back up for just one moment. We, uh, each year, the board looks at our uh, financial condition analysis, projections, um, from a, from really uh, an an outside perspective, an outside consultant to kind of look give us that independent uh, lens of of what our situation looks like, and the reason we do it now is our uh, budget um, and our audit financial audit has been completed, our budget's been adopted, um, and our audit from uh, with our fiscal year ending June thirtieth um, is is done. So that's a, a great time to do these projections. So that's kind of. Um, how it uh, came into play. And we've been doing this for the last several years. So I think it's wise of the board to look at this every year uh, as they do. Um, just a couple of the slides, if we wanna to go to the next slide, um, the financial history we start out with, he starts out with and shows kind of the revenue and expenses over a 10 year period. Um, the, the red dots are the revenues and the blue dots are the expenses. Obviously, um, you know, we, we'd like to always have uh, our revenues exceed um, our expenses, we've had a few years there where we, we did not have that happen. Um, but th these are the audited numbers that, that over that period of time. Um, the growth, I can go back for just a minute, Jim. Um, the annual revenue growth was 1.3% um, over that period of time, while the uh, expenses uh, were at 1%. And then a another chart that kind of includes that data, but looks at it a little bit differently. Um, that horizontal line where the zero is, that's the expenses. So anything below that obviously is, is a, showing a shortfall. So um, the majority of this time, you know, the, the budget was um, revenues exceeded expenses um, and the revenues uh, exceeded expenses by that 6.2 million almost uh, over that period of time. So um, that's some good information. The historical fund balance history, it's been pretty steady. As you can see, it, it, we had a few dips there in uh, 16, 17, 17, 18, but we're ticking back up um, by passing some balanced budgets the last couple of years and having some modest surpluses. So that's helped uh, push that fund balance back up. Um, so that's what that, uh, and the, again, these are audited numbers. Um, the other th thing, just briefly, what he spoke about were are just the, uh, not only the financial condition of our district, and he's very pleased with, with how it looks and, the, and the, some of the decisions the board has made. Uh, he also gave an overview of the state uh, financial condition um, and the impact of, of that on our district. So um, uh, the state's, uh, I guess in a nutshell, has, has a lot of struggles uh, that they're dealing with and uh, situations in terms of the COVID uh, the budget, um, they have a, a tax, graduated income tax uh, ballot uh, question. Um, so they've got a lot of challenges ahead of them. 
but right now our uh, financing uh, uh, from the state state aid um, is projected to be uh, consistent through this year anyhow. So we're, we're uh, holding on to that and happy about that. So that's kind of uh, the overview of the financial uh, projections and analysis that we heard earlier this evening and, and what uh, our situation is um, at the current state. All right, thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, does anyone have any questions regarding the financial projections? Uh, if not, we'll move on to the 2020 estimated tax levy and Bruce. Yes, thank you, Mr. Wiedemann. This is the time of year that the, the board acts on the tax levy uh, for the upcoming year. Um, so I just wanted to run through this. We, we uh, discussed this um, in our finance committee earlier this evening as well. Um, but we kind of went through the whole uh, tax levy 101 kind of uh, per, uh, overview um, what is a property tax levy? It's the amount of dollars, uh, property tax dollars that school district requests to operate the district for the upcoming school year. Uh, it is the primary funding source for the school districts. No surprise, I think to all of you, uh, it does account for about 83% of Fenton's funding. And the tax levy, I think most importantly is, is to be aware of is it's limited by law and how in terms of how much you can increase that uh, levy. Um, and that's the PTEL is the property tax extension limitation law. And that's been in play in uh, DuPage County since 1992. So it's limited by the CPI or 5%, whichever is less. Um, how is it calculated? Uh, factors involved in the calculation. So you start with the previous year's extension. So for the 2020 uh, levy year, we start with the 2019 extension. Uh, we, we multiply that by the consumer price index or the inflation rate of inflation, which is 2.3%. And then that gives you your estimated extension for 2020. Um, when looking at the tax rate, um, the tax rate is equal to the total extended taxes divided by the district's EAV. So the calculation for 2019, which we know uh, already is uh, the 26 million 225 uh, 032 divided by the EAV equalized assessed valuation, which is 1 million billion 289 And that uh, comes to a, a rate of 2.0331. And that's what you'll see on your tax bills. The 2020 estimated extension is that 26 million 852 And these are estimates, of course, uh, divided by um, the EAV of 1,335,050307. Um, we see a little bit of a dip in the rate, projected rate of 2.0141, um, and that's really a result of the higher EAV uh, increasing. And that's a projection as well on that. Uh, how do we determine how much to levy? Our financial projections, as the board heard earlier this evening, our budget development and the educational programs um, and initiatives were, were, uh, that are included in the budget will drive that. Uh, our debt schedule of, of what we owe, um, and then what are the variables that uh, come into play with the levy, um, the CPI and the rate of inflation, um, new property and the debt schedule are, are the three factors that will uh, change with the levy each year. Um, how much are we levying? So we do typically, you know, we talked about 2.3%. Um, the only other piece to that is the new property. So that is on top of the 2.3% of what we are allowed legally to, to arrive at. Um, we do, because it's unknown and it's an estimate and a projection, and we're not certain what that new property looks like, and, the, and we won't know that until the spring, we do uh, inflate that levy somewhat to, to make sure that we're uh, covered adequately to capture all new tax revenue that is available to us. So we're uh, recommending uh, a levy of 4.99%. We'll likely get less than that, um, of that 2.59%, and that's based on the CPI plus new property. Uh, and that would be about a $660,000 increase in uh, tax dollars in the capped funds. And that information, uh, we talked to the Addison Township Assessor for a projection, 
Uh, the EAV is projected at three and a half percent, and new property is projected at three million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So those are the factors that go into that, uh, helping uh, arrive at that estimated uh, increase. So as I said, you know, we what we ask for and what we get are and, and don't necessarily equal. So. The levy request for last year was at 4.9%. Uh, we actually received the 2.22, um, 2018, 3.76, and we actually received 2.37%. So the levy typically request is, and you can ask for whatever you want, but the law, that PTEL legislation is always gonna control uh, the amount uh, of what you can receive. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a safety net that we put into play. That's why we increased that beyond the the uh, CPI. So as you can see through the, the these last five years and the five prior to that, we levied greater than what we received because it is an estimate and you want to make sure that you, you don't uh, miss out on anything. So um, that kind of is how it played out for the last five years in terms of uh, what it looked like. Uh, and then the, the property tax levy adoption, um, we would ask the board to act on the estimated tax levy this evening uh, and approve that. November 18th, we would uh, bring forth a resolution for the board to act on the final levy. Uh, and again, because it's under 5% and, and you only have to have a levy or a public hearing, I should say, if the levy is exceeding 5%, we're not uh, going to exceed that. So a hearing is not required. And then after it's filed um, uh, or approved, I should say, it would be filed with the Page County Clerk. And the, the payments, um, and I know in your background information you have this, but the payments uh, for the taxes would come in uh, for the 2020 levy would come the first it's basically in two installments or two times of the year in different fiscal years so uh, in the spring of 2021 so june may june we would see, receive a, roughly about half of the levy and then the following half would come in the following fall so september october so here's what the chart looks like in terms of the uh, levy at 4.99%. If we look at the proposed levy, the first highlighted yellow column there, header, um, those are the individual uh, levy amounts by fund of what are uh, what's requested. Uh, the capped funds, uh, about three quarters of the way down there, um, is that 26,757,664, which is a 4.99% increase. You can see that two columns over. Um, and that's uh, measured against the 2019 extension. Um, all in, when you add in the debt service, um, the total uh, levy request would be $27,514,000, uh, and that's a 4.86% uh, increase when you add in the debt service. So that's kind of uh, what we are presenting tonight for the board to act on, and that's uh, kind of how it uh, plays out to the right there with the change in dollars, uh, percentage uh, change to the fund, percent of the levy or what that represents, and then the uh, projected rate. And again, these rates are a little bit higher because it's a, it's an inflated amount. So it'll, the late rate will likely be less than what's showing here. And the next slide um, shows the uh, EAVs by district in that uh, second column. And then it's um, ranked by... Um, district tax rate. So we're the third lowest tax rate out of the seven high school districts in the state of that 2.0331. And then the rates uh, per the individual funds are to the right, but the total rate when you add it up, that would show up on your tax bill for 2019 is that 2.0331. And then the next slide um, just shows the, the rates again, um, the, the column, the 2019 column is over on the right. Um, this time, the yellow highlighted column, uh, Fenton, uh, is that 2.0331, as we mentioned. Um, and the estimated bill for a $300,000 home, a third of the value uh, for, at, uh, for a Fenton taxpayer is $2,032.90. $2, so um, we're right there, uh, the third uh, lowest out of the, the seven school districts. So we're asking the board to act on the uh, approval of the estimated levy tonight. Um, but certainly before we do that, we I, I want to entertain any questions that you may have about the levy. Yeah. 
If there's uh, no questions or comments, then uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the 2020 estimated tax levy as presented that reflects an increase of 4.99%. I'll make the motion, Paul. Okay, thank you, Mary. Do you have a second, please? I will second it. Patty. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Mary, roll call, please. Peyton Hope. Yes. Figaro. Yes. Ting Paul Pong. Yes. Jalwick. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. All right, that motion has passed. Uh, the next item is the food service program. And Bruce, that is yours also. All right, you get to hear from me one more time tonight. Um, so this is our um, food service uh, contract amendment for this school year. Um, as you may recall, last March, the board approved a, an extension with our current uh, provider, Arbor Management, for the 2020-21 school year. Uh, since that approval, um, there's been a pandemic that has uh, impacted our program significantly. Um, so what, what's happening is the Illinois State Board of Education and the USDA are allowing districts and, and contracted companies, management companies, to uh, negotiate a rate increase. Typically, the only way you could uh, allow for a rate increase was to go back out to bid. But because of the extraordinary circumstances we're operating under, they've made an exemption to uh, come to terms, the district and the company, uh, to arrive at a rate that um, is, is agreeable um, to move forward with. Um, part of the reason, obviously, for them to look for a rate increase is, um, you know, to break even. Um, they're not looking to um, for a windfall in any kind of uh, increase, but but they do, um, they can't subsidize uh, the program either. So they're, they're, they came in with a business model to um, initially to, you know, operate uh, profitably um, and, and not come in to, to lose money um, as, a, as an entity. So we're operating currently under the summer food service program. So that's an extension from this past summer, as you recall. So it's a kind of a universal free program. So that's been extended through the entire school year. Initially, they uh, it wasn't extended at the beginning of the year. Then it was extended through December. Now it's been extended through the whole school year. So that's great news. So all of our kids, they can come here. Um, we provide a lunch to them. So the kids who are here, the groups of kids that we talked about earlier that come into the building, we're, we're feeding them. They, they are, have a meal available to them. And then kids who aren't here, they can come and pick up a meal. Uh, and it can be for multiple days. So, um, and I think that's that's working out well. So we're trying to accommodate uh, folks to increase that participation as, as much as we can. Um, so the amendment regarding the contract, um, it would uh, impact the breakfast and lunch meal rates. So there's a there's a rate that we get received for each one. Um, and on the memo um, that I provided, uh, again, uh, they're looking for a meal rate uh, amount that for a break even uh, point for Barber and not to go, uh, it will not go towards overhead or profit margin. It would just um, cover any shortfall that they would incur. So the districts uh, reimburse for each meal served. The combined rates that we currently receive for this program, that will be constant through the whole year, would be $6.41. So there's a uh, $3.05, I think it is, for the lunch, and then $2.50 for the, for the um, uh, yeah, two fifty for the um, uh, uh, breakfast, excuse me. Um, there, what they are proposing to charge us is six dollars uh, and five cents, uh, six point oh five eight seven. So we would we're still receiving more reimbursement than what Arbor would charge us. Um, we think that's reasonable. We've we've shared that uh, they've shared their information with us. There's cost information. They had a slight deficit for the month of September, and and this would be effective September or a, a retroactive to September first. So. Um, they're asking for uh, to consider an amendment tonight. Um, it, the administration is is supporting that recommendation, um, and we're asking the board to consider that um, going forward. Um, 
there may be uh, another adjustment going forward. We're not sure. It depends on participation because um, their costs have increased uh, with packaging costs. Um, even though they've reduced their labor, there are still labor costs involved and, and uh, lower participation really increases the meal costs. So that, that's what, what's happening there. So uh, if the board um, has any questions, certainly let me pause for a moment and, and answer them for you. If not, um, I guess, go ahead. Bruce, Bruce is just to reiterate the reimbursement by, by the government is greater uh, than the actual still, cost. Uh, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that is correct, yes. But meaning, though, they were amending their contract, the reimbursement, their, their contract that they're proposing right now is still below what we're going to receive as a school district from the, uh, from, from the government. That is correct. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question, okay. Katie? Um, Bruce, I do have a question. So I saw that the numbers went up in October. Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, you're kind of cutting out a little bit. Go ahead. I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, I can't. Yeah, sort of. You're you're kind of fading in and out. So the numbers in um, October almost doubled the ones in September. Uh, yeah, okay. about a hundred and forty. Um, so, yeah. How about now? Can you hear me now? I yes yes. Uh. Okay, so is that just as people are getting more more aware of the program, you think? Yeah, you know, that's a, a great observation. I think that's part of it, Patty, for sure. I think the other pieces were our primary service. Yeah, my internet's cutting in and out. It's not that important. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just answer the question if anybody wants to hear it. But um, so, yeah, I think the part... Um, the um, no, word is getting out. We advertise that uh, every week pretty much um, in our newsletter, our Wednesday words. Um, and then we also uh, serve the meals. on prime, Our primary days are Tuesday and Thursday, although we're pretty much serving every day. Tuesday and Thursday are the days where families, students can come and pick up multiple meals. So they can pick up uh, three days worth of meals on one day and four days worth of meals on the other day because we are serving Saturday and Sunday as well. So I think having them come and, and that seems like a worthwhile trip for them get multiple meals at, 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 on a given day. And I think that's helped build participation. So Bruce, we've, very good question. Bruce, we've added hours, right? We've added hours on Tuesday evenings. Oh, we've, yeah, that's good. yeah. Yep. Very good. Uh, we did. So Tuesday and Thursday, we, we had our standard hours for our, uh, you know, is it 10, 30, Yovan? To it's uh, 8, 30 to 10 and then uh, noon to one thirty, right? And then on Tuesdays, we also serve four to six in the afternoon. So I think that's, we're trying to accommodate families as, uh, as, as best we can. And I think that's, that's helped as well. So that's an, uh, in addition to what we've, um, Yovan already mentioned. Plus we're bringing more students in and with more students, we're obviously giving them um, meals as well. So yeah, a, a lot of factors as we continue to go through. So. Yeah. And, and we hope to just continue to build that number higher as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bruce. Um, great presentation. Uh, it's good to see that program is uh, going well. Um, so if there are no other further questions, uh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approve the attached food service contract amendment for the meal rate adjustments as presented. I will make the motion. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? Patty seconds. Oh, okay, thank you, Patty. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Hill. Yes. Tinko Pong. <clears throat> yes. 
Jalowick? Second it. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. <laughs> All right, the motion is passed. The next item is the, the discussion only item regarding the 2020 Illinois Association of School Boards uh, Resolution yes. Com Committee Report. Um, I asked James, you should have all received the uh, resolution committee report. I asked James to re review these resolutions as to how they pertain to the school district. Um, uh, as the uh, district's uh, delegate, I also attended the webinar, which was held today, where these resolutions were discussed in preparation for the November 14th uh, vote. Uh, we're out. I will vote on behalf of the uh, school board. Um, James, I'll let you go through these. Uh, the James is in agreement with all of the committee's uh, recommendations. Uh, the committee has spent a lot of time going through these resolution, these proposed resolutions, uh, and has researched these, uh, you know, before the uh, meeting today. But James, I'll let you go through these uh, resolutions. You bet. Uh, so uh, hopefully you have, uh, have looked at or skimmed over the resolutions. Um, they're quite lengthy. Uh, this year there's 12 uh, resolutions. Um, just to keep in mind for the board, these are non-biting resolutions. They don't become into law. Okay. This is just basically supporting or not supporting a, a resolution. Jim, if you could blow up that slide up, if you can, a little bit. Uh, yep, thank you. If we could look at page uh, two, please. Okay, page two. There are, and this is your association. This came from your association, the Illinois Association of School Board. They represent you, and you guys are part of that body. There is a total of 22 uh, members in this committee, committee that has uh, looked over, studied uh, these 12 resolutions. And uh, they are really the subject matter experts. Paul has asked me to take a look at it and give my opinion. Uh, these are very smart folks who spent uh, hundreds of hours talking to their constituents about these resolutions. We have not, I have not. Um, I'm just looking at the finished product and will give you my recommendation. Good news is if you look at page, um, you can scroll down Jim to page uh, four. Okay, I've highlighted your association's recommendation in yellow. And those are, and, and I'm in aligned with those recommendation as well. So can we just stop there and just say, we, <laughs> we're going to, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just kidding. Uh, so here are the resolutions. One thing to keep in mind, there are 12 of them, okay? The first eight are new resolutions. Something from your association, they came up with this resolutions, eight of them. The next three is regards into charter schools. You know, there's, there's a lot of public school versus charter schools sort of back and forth. So you could see there uh, where your association has voted. Uh, and lastly is really a belief statement in equity. Okay. And um, it's, there is, a, 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 your association has a belief statement. They're just adding something to it, uh, a piece of equity. Let's go back to nine and 10 again. Um, uh, reaffirm. Now, the key word there is reaffir reaffirmation of existing position, okay? So number, resolution 9, 10, 11, Jim, we're on page four, um, is basically they change it a bit and reaffirming what the, the resolutions and belief statements that you guys have established already. So you could see where the votes are going there or the recommendations are over there, and I'm in agreement with it, Okay. Uh, so Paul has asked me to quickly go over this, and I will, okay? Um, but you see the, the, the recommendations from your association, which is aligned with my recommendations for the board through the lens of our district. So let's scroll down. There's 12 of them, okay? I will read basically the uh, folks that submitted it and, and your association, your committee's um, response. Uh, number one is a loan program a loan program. So there's a district in Grays Lake. Uh, be it resolved that the Illinois Association of School Board shall request the Illinois State, Illinois State, okay, State of Illinois to establish a low-cost loan program for public school districts. 
This program will allow local dollars to flow more directly to students while providing relief to local taxpayers. We do not have a loan program, okay, in, in public education. So your committee says, basically it says, do not adopt this, their recommendation, do not adopt this. The committee was concerned about the uncertainty of where the funds would come from, okay? Create a program like this in Illinois. It was, however, recognized that there is a significant need for financial assistance for school infrastructure. The committee uh, questioned the idea of a loan program for fund districts, here's the big one, could use to cover costs the state should be helping district pay for. So why take out a loan program while the state should be giving you that money, okay? Uh, the resolution committee recommends do not adopt. We agree with that. Second one is gun storage, gun storage, okay, from Glen Ellen. Be it resolved that the Illinois Association of School Boards shall support and advocate for legislation which strengthens child safe gun storage laws in the state of Illinois requiring gun owner to store firearms, whether they are loaded or unloaded in a security lock container. So they're looking at the lock container. If a person under the age of 18 is likely to gain access to the weapon without permission, your association recommends not to adopt. And here's the reason. The vast majority of Illinois Association of School Board Position Statement deal directly with issues that happen inside a school district inside a school district. This proposal will be a departure from the practice and the committee questions whether the association resources should be spent on non-educational issues. So they're not seeing this as an educational issues. Well, the committee considered the argument of the submitting district on the potential impact on the student. The majority of the member felt that this was not an issue for the Illinois Association of School Board's involvement. The resolution committee recommends do not adopt the submitting uh, district has appealed for uh, appealed the recommendation of the committee and will have an opportunity to bring that proposal at the delegate assembly. Okay, I think that's cut and dry. Your association says, hey, look, this is not a school issue. This is outside of our district. Okay, uh, this is more a personal and a family issue. So there you have two do not adopt. Okay, uh, which we agree, I, I agree with that as well. Okay, number three, in regards to report card, um, be it resolved that the Illinois Association of School Boards shall support legislations that would direct the Illinois State Board of Education to prepare and disclose all available school report card data for the current academic year by June 1st of that year. So they want to move it up three months ahead of time. We usually get that in October or September. So the, your associate, you know, well, Peoria, is asking that it moved up to June 1st. Your association recommends do not adopt. And the reason being, unfortunately, the Illinois State Board of Re uh, Report Card includes information that cannot be tabulated and report until the close of the fiscal year, June 30th. That's basically, we take our tests, our SATs, uh, those tests in April. It's hard to have that turned around by June 1st. In addition to that, many district a June 1 deadline for this data would be impossible to meet to determine the student placement and graduation completion criteria as many students are finishing the last quarter after June 1. The resolution committee agreed that uh, untimely information regarding student learning hinders the ability of schools to meet the learning needs of students, but also felt the report card would not be, best way, be the best way to expedite assessment results for the purpose of stated. I, IASB staff and committee members agreed to continue work to address this issue in that in another way. So once again, adopt it. It's hard to get all those information by June 1st, okay? Especially when you're testing in April. So there's it's another do not adopt, which I agree with there. This next one is number four, is really about pre-K teachers licensure. I recommend we uh, to uh, follow your your committee's, uh, your association's uh, recommendation, which is not, do not adopt. And the reason for that is that Fenton High School is not a pre-K program. We are a high school district. But in a nutshell, uh, a district, uh, Albico, uh, wants all uh, pre-service teachers to take uh, more English proficiency classes um, 
uh, before they get into teaching, in particular the t um, uh, in, uh, teachers that are involved with speech language pathology, special education, reading specialist, reading teacher, grades language arts, uh, English language arts, elementary education, and so forth. Once again, it's targeting the pre uh, the pre K elementary school level. Um, so your association recommends do not adopt this. Um, and the reason being is basically the teacher preparation programs that anticipated having a self-contained environment usually have reading courses as part of their curriculum. They're basically said they're getting enough reading classes because it's part of the curriculum. However, with the passage of Public Act 101-0220, the requirement that teachers candidates pass a test, test of basic skills to receive a professional education license was eliminated. Now, sk now, skills in the area of reading are only tested for content endorsement. Historically, your association has not been taking the position on teacher education program at universities. School districts have the authority to include the criteria it desires when posting teacher vacancy position. So what the, what's that basically saying is we're not involved in what takes place at the uh, under, undergrad before you get your certification. When that person graduates and they're applying for a job, let's say for here at Fenton, then we could require some of the classes, uh, but not prior. If a school district desires this additional accreditation, it could require it. Committee members are, were also concerned that the statutory increasing standards for teacher license, licensure and adding new testing requirements could have an adverse effect in filling teaching position in some areas of this state. Basically, they're saying there's a teacher shorter. Why are we making it harder or putting more classes for uh, to become a teacher? This would be even more problematic given the current teacher shortage situation. There it is. Lastly, the original resolution seems to add a mandate, which the, traditionally the IASB advocates against opting for local flexibility instead. The committee supported the concept within the original resolution. However, it was noted that the language of the original resolution was too rigid in its approach. So once again, do not adopt is your association's recommendation, which I agree with. Uh, number five, okay. Let me know if you have any questions here. Can slow down a little bit. Number five, be a resolve that the Illinois Association of School Boards shall support efforts to direct the Illinois State Board of Education to expand the issuance of provi uh, provisional teacher license to all curricular areas. Basically, um, uh, if someone does not have that specific topic or endorsement, uh, is to provide this provincial teachers licenses to all curricular areas. So if there's a if, if a school district is uh, needs a math teacher and this particular individual does not have that endorsement, uh, can we give them a license which allows them to teach math while um, pursuing that that math licensure? Okay, your your association recommends to adopt. Okay, that's because there's a teacher shortage in Illinois. Okay, let them work towards that endorsement while teaching. Um, and I agree with that one as well. Uh, six, e-learning on election day. E-learning on election day. Be resolved that the uh, Illinois Authority of School Board shall support and encourage legislation that would allow school districts to use an e-learning day or remote learning in lieu of closing a school. So instead of closing the school down, because we have election at Fenton, as an example, we go to e-learning, Okay or the district on an election day during a public health response requiring use of the school or on any other day during which a school is mandated to be used for public function during a school hours. So instead of closing school down, you wanna use e-learning day. Um, I believe Wooddale um, uh, folks can vote there and um, uh, and this would might uh, pertain to that situation. Um, your association is to recommend to adopt, okay, to adopt. And the reason being additional school calendar to establish student contact days, vacation days, and other holidays are negotiated with the bargaining units or unions before the school year begins. E-learning or remote learning options demands much preparation and buy-in by staff, parents, and students. And it should not be assumed that the schools are available to provide that type of learning at will without sufficient notice 
for the school district and, and staff to consider implica implication. The resolution of the committee is to adopt, okay? Uh, number eight, number eight. This is about local control during the pandemic. I wonder how this got in there. Maybe it's COVID, okay? Uh, be it resolved that the Illinois Association of School Boards shall support and advocate for school to open back up and allow school, uh, school boards and administrations to make decisions based upon what is best for the school and the school community during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is once again, local control. Let us decide what's good for us, okay? Um, is that eight? Am I reading? Oops, sorry, there was a seven. Let me go back to seven. That's why they say do not adopt. Okay, because here, quickly, seven and eight are basically the same thing. Seven and eight are basically the same thing, okay? So seven, let me go back to seven. Instead, I went to jump to eight. Be a resolved that the Illinois Association of School Boards shall encourage members of the U.S. Congress, the Illinois General State Assembly, related administrative agency, and the state and federal courts to take a regional approach in response to national health emergency. That regional approach basically is the code word for local control, okay? And that's why it says local control pandemic, okay? And your association uh, recommends to adopt it, that we have control instead of the state telling us what to do or the government telling us what to do. I agree with that, okay? Uh, their, your association's rationale is the submitting district expressed a concern that there was significant difference in the prevalence of COVID-19 cases in many areas of the state compared to Chicago and the surrounding communities. Yet all the areas of the state were subject to the same closure requirement and district uh, restriction despite those differences. You remember that the certain states were real low numbers and we had not high numbers in the north, uh, but they had the same mitigation and same sort of rules. Illinois Association has historically supported local control. So your association, your association historically has supported local control with a position statement named as such since 1976 and agreed with a standing alone position for this specific situation was warranted. So local control, your association says, let's support it, recommend to adopt. Okay, this next one is the same thing. The recommendation is not to adopt, and the only reason for that because it's similar to seven. Okay, it's similar to seven. That's asking the same thing. So we'll go jump to nine. Okay, this is a reaffirmation of existing positions. So your association has this over here. They're just reaffirming their position. First one is number nine, position statement, renewal of charters. The Illinois Association of School Boards shall urge adoption of legislation that allows for participation of the host school district in the charter school renewal process for the state authorized charter schools. Your association recommends for you to adopt it. I agree with it. And the reason being is the issue presented in the resolution would only apply to the district that hosts a state authorized charter school. Okay, so basically if a charter is in a school district that public school should have a voice in regards to the, its authorization. Why? Because the money that should go to public school is not being now being split to a charter school. Okay, um, uh, this is easy math. If you're supposed to get two million dollars and now you got a charter school, you only might get one million. Okay, state authorized charter schools are charter schools run by an entity of the state of Illinois and in existence over the opposition of local school district. State authorized charter school presents fiscal challenges to local school districts because they receive per capita tuition dollars from the Illinois from Illinois that were originally designated for the host district, aka public school. Okay, so here adopted. Okay, next one is again it's about charter school. Uh, position statement for charter schools at risk students. Let me just define at risk students. At risk students are students receiving free and reduced lunch, low income, uh, works with DCFS, Department of Ch uh, uh, someone help me out, DCFS, uh, child DCFS. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, those are our at risk students. 
Okay, that's the definition of it. There's always been a criticization, uh, a critique on charter schools is they Child don't and call family students. services, and 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 we know that. Uh, so the position statement here is that the Illinois Association of School Boards shall urge the adoption of legislation that defines the special expectation of state authorized charter schools to educate at risk students, including the requirement that the state authorized charter schools program and operation be specifically designed to attract and service at risk students and that the state authorized charter school be required to report to the public its progress in achieving these expectations, okay? Your association recommends to adopt that, okay? I agree with that, I think it's fair. We educate all students, okay? Um, so it's not the same playing field it should be. Moving on to 11, okay? This is in regards to, again, charter school, um, uh, and school funding. The Illinois Association of School Boards urge adoption of legislation which would create a new methodology for the funding of state authorized charter schools which would not have negative financial impact on the host school. That would be nice, particularly in the spirit of evidence-based funding. With respect to the state authorized virtual charter schools further limit, uh, withstanding the state funds from host school districts in proportion to the per pupil expenditure used for public maintenance, classroom supplies, transportation, safety and security and others costs unique to brick and mortar schools for all state authorized charter schools required that the proof of continuing enrollment and attendance be submitted quarterly with prorated refunds to the host school district upon withdrawal of students from the charter school. So basically this is a financial tracking system, okay? Um, your association recommends to adopt this. Current law state funding from a local district and distributed to state authorized charter schools. If the local district look, look to raise revenues and provide additional resources to students from local resources, the state authorized charter schools would receive an even larger share of the local district state funding. So recommends to adopt. Last one in regards to uh, equity and its belief statement. Uh, the Illinois Association of School Board urges that its member district and its leadership of member districts to integrate the principles of equity and inclusion in school curriculum, policies, programs, and operation, ensuring every student is welcome and supported in a respectable learning environment. We have that here at Fenton, okay? Obviously, this is a belief statement. Your association recommends to adopt this. The, uh, the committee supports the concept that Illinois Association of School Board needs to be an, uh, to be an equity and inclus inclusive leader in the area of education for the state of Illinois. So that's basically it. Let me go back to page four. I'll summarize it one more time. So we, you have 12 resolutions, okay? First eight is new. Three is reaffirmation. It's there already. You guys adopted it. They just want to support. They added some few things there. They want you guys to support it again. And a belief statement, include equity there. I agree with all of them. Your committee, I'm um, sorry, your association wants you to vote a certain way. Um, that's where we're at. So if you look at the yellow there, that's indicated. Uh, those would be the recommendations. I'll leave it to you, Paul. Okay. Thank you, James. Thank you for going through those. Um, Based on, I mean, do, does anyone have any questions or do we have a consensus on the IAB's uh, resolution committee recommendation as well as going forward with James's recommendation, which is in line with uh, the resolution committee's recommendations? You know, we're not voting on this. We just need to I know there's a consensus um, on, uh, on these So I know how to vote. Uh, at the at the November fourteenth um, uh, meeting, I agree. Yes, the only one that I had a question on. Well, I think two. Um, in terms of the low cost loan, so the, the I think it was the first one. When when we look at yes. um, situations where. 
a district would need access to cash, you know, crisis, this, maybe it uh, extends further and and we go into uh, a need for access to cash. Is that something where um, a district could decide for themselves? I mean, obviously it's gonna go through the board and we have to have, have clear full deliberation on that. But, you know, is that something we, we wanna, we still have as an open uh, option? Even if I believe so, Kid. Have have the professional and the subject matter expert answer that question, Bruce. The question is: If we're on dire straits, can we ask for money or sell bonds or ask for bonds and so forth? There was a threshold um, for for what purpose specifically? If let's we're in dire straits, we need money. We need cash. Well, for, there, let's, say, let's say there was a tornado here. Uh, destroys all our roof is going to cost us seventy million dollars to get it fixed, and we need a loan. Well, yeah, I'd start with our insurance company, I guess. But um, you know, there there's funding mechanisms, yes, and, and there's uh, like some emergency loan provisions. Um, there, there, we have avenues, but um, you know, for a typical you know operating budget or uh, major infrastructure improvements that are planned. You know that would that's that's uh, would would require voter approval for those types of things. But um, you know, for emergencies such as that, yeah, there there's provisions that we could uh, you know get a line of credit from a bank or um, you know those types of things. Um, there there we could. It, it depends on the circumstance, I guess. But yes, there's there's uh, uh, choices op options that we, we would have. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would. You know, I, I, we always hope that it never comes to that. But just to uh, to know that we have access to to cash, low low cost loan that is, would would probably be a good thing. And um, then the second thing is um, with respect to um, the shortage of teachers. Um, it, it sounds like you know there's there's a real crisis with that because if we're um, we're wanting to if we're wanting to extend the the license to, you know, for example, math teachers, social study teachers, where they don't have to have that license, if we do that, and I'm not opposed to it because we need to have teachers in the classrooms, um, is there is there a uh, requirement and timeline on when they need to get that license in, and and actually get it legitimate? Yes, we do. I believe it's years, but let's have uh, Dr. Benson answer that question. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, the, the teacher shortage is real, but it's sort of depending on what part of the state you're in. This is primarily a central Illinois, rural Illinois issue. We're fortunate in that we've been able to attract quality candidates, typically with a few years of experience from other districts. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, I, I, I really don't have much of a position on this compared to other districts that are really in a difficult situation, finding staff. Uh, but, but, you know, typically we want somewhat of a rigorous process to become a teacher. And um, I understand some of these, these temporary provisional type things, but when we're hiring a teacher, we prefer to find one that is already uh, licensed and perhaps even has some experience fr from another district. Yeah, exactly. Sam, real quickly, uh, just trying to get to the heart of the question of Kit. How long is the provisional um, certification or licensure good for? Is it three years, three to five? Usually it's three years, but they're, they're all different based on, uh, like for an ESL uh, endorsement, a short-term one is three years. Okay. But the other provisions for other different types of uh, teaching positions. Leo, did you have a question, sir? No, well, I'm okay with that. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right, then um, we'll move forward then at the uh, um, on November 14th with those uh, recommendations. Uh, again, thank you. So we'll move on to the committee reports. 
Uh, Juliet and Kit, anything on Bensonville Community Foundation? Oh, I don't not since last month, we haven't met. No. There hasn't been anything. Okay, great. Um, finance committee report, we had a finance committee uh, meeting today, which we met, we discussed the financial projections uh, facility and the, and the tax levy proposal uh, at that meeting. Um, Marianne, unless, do you have anything further to add to that? No, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, then on the I IASP delegate, uh, just a couple things. The first one is there was a question from a board member regarding our process for uh, public comments. I reached out to D at the IASB and confirmed we are following the prescribed best practices regarding public comments uh, as well as policy. And Jim, if we can have that policy, on the screen. Jim. Next slide, Jim. All right, great, thank you. Um, James, if you could really go read through that really quickly, just to, uh, so we can have a quick review. Absolutely. So this is our policy in regards to public comments. Um, at each regular regular and special open meeting, members of the public and district employees may comment or ask a question of the school board subject to reasonable constraints. The individuals appearing before the board are expected to follow these guidelines. Number one, address the board only at the appropriate time as indicated on the agenda and when recognized by the board president. Okay, we're doing that. Number two, identify oneself and, and be brief. Identify oneself and be brief. Ordinary comments shall be limited to three minutes in unusual circumstances and when an individual has made a request to advance to speak for a longer period of time, the individual may be allowed to speak for more than three minutes. Number three, observe the board president's decision to shorten public comments to conserve time and give maximum numbers of individuals an opportunity to speak. Number four, observe the board's president's decision to determine procedural matters regarding public participation not otherwise covered in the board policy. Number five, conduct oneself with respect and civility towards others and otherwise abide by the policy uh, board policy 8.30 visitors visitors to and conduct on school property. Petitions or written correspondence to the board shall be presented to the board in the next regular board packet. Great, thank you, James. Uh, the next item is the, just a reminder that November 4th is the virtual DuPage division meeting. Uh, all the board members have been registered for that. Um, you, and you should get the link then by email to, to uh, join that meeting. Uh, that's from six, it's planned from 6.15 to, to 7.30 on November 4th. Um, I took part today in the IASB Delegate Assembly and Annual Business Meeting uh, in preparation for the uh, Delegate Assembly on November 14th as discussed. Um, the last item is the IASB Virtual Summit which is on November 20th, nine to three. All the board members have been registered uh, for that. And we should all be receiving uh, links uh, to that so we can join that uh, summit. Um, that's all I have for the IASB. Uh, next item is the LEND. Um, who? Uh, Leo. Who was Leo. there? No, it was James. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, we, our, our, our meeting is this Friday. It's this Friday. Okay. Then we, we should know more than on the November meeting. Um, Ned Sec, Leo, and Patty. I was actually there. I led the, um, I, I'm the, I'm the chair for Ned Sec. Leo was present. Uh, Leo, anything I missed, let me know. Uh, the big ticket item was the audit, uh, kind of like what we did last last month uh, with Bruce and our uh, audit company. Uh, they presented for about 30 minutes and uh, second big ticket item is just a, an update on COVID. 
kind of like what we do here, as well as remote learning and hybrid learning. T and NEDSEC schools are doing both, both remote in one area or one school district and another school, di uh, school district is in, in, in hybrid. Leo, did I miss anything? Uh, just the financial report. Okay. Yeah, it was good. And uh, we got uh, one resignation. We're going to miss that girl. Yes, we yes. are. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, it, it was all. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Policy committee, Patty and Kit. I don't I don't know if there's any I don't believe there's anything new with that. No new business to report. I just want to thank pa uh, Patty and, and, and Kit in regards to the policy the committee. You saw that in the consent agenda. We passed uh, I believe 18 SAM uh, policies from press. Uh, you guys to all help us out get through that uh, the last two months, and uh, we will be putting that in our policies here at Pension. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next board meeting, new business. Next board meeting is Wednesday, November 18th, uh, 2020 at 7 p.m. So that will be our next meeting. And with that, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn? I'll make the motion, Paul. <laughs> Mary Ann, may I have a second? second. I second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Bait No. Yes. Ting Po Pong. Yes. Jalwood. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. All right, motion has passed. Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for support. Thank you, board. Good night.